morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the SDG Global Festival of Action. If you haven't fine-tuned already to other sessions, my name is Marina Ponti, and I'm the director of the UN SDG Action Campaign. We are delighted that our festival, with more than 22,000 people watching from 201 countries and territories, is also hosting this special discussion on the G20 and the 2030 Agenda, a pathway to a sustainable recovery. This workshop is organized by the Italian Alliance for Sustainable Development, one of the nine exceptional finalists of our SDG Action Awards. Let me use the opportunity to congratulate again ASBI's president, who I know is watching now, Pierluigi Stefanini, for the amazing work that ASBI is carrying out for the goals. Today, we face a series of monumental crises that touch every country and every person. Our health and our economies have been shaken. Trust in institutions has declined. We must respond to all these crises. At the same time, we must also close longstanding inequalities that have left us at risk, including gender discrimination. We also have no more time to wait in taking ambitious action on climate change. On all fronts, the role of the world's most advanced economies is critical in propelling a turning point for people and the planet. Much depends on restoring multilateral cooperation, which will underpin successful recovery and resilience in the months and the years ahead. I welcome this opportunity to hear from our distinguished panelists. They will discuss potential solutions for how we can build forward together more just and more sustainable societies. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator. Please welcome Muzonda Munda, who is the director of the Rome Center for Sustainable Development. She brings more than 25 years of experience on sustainability issues across different sectors, from civil society to her government in Zambia and the United Nations. Muzonda, we are delighted to have you with us, and you have the floor. Grazie mille, Marina. Thank you so very much. Ladies and gentlemen on the panel, welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, everybody watching and streaming in and really connecting through to us today, welcome. It's going to be exciting, and we have such a fantastic panel of speakers at this SDG Global Festival of Action. Hashtag turn it around. It's absolutely phenomenal to be here and also really be hosted by the Italian government of the Rome Center. The Italian government also happens to be the president for the G20. Now, this is a very interesting and exciting process, and we're going to talk about the G20 and the Sustainable Development Goals. As you've heard from Marina, the complexity of COVID-19 and Italy as a country has borne its brunt, and it's really painful to watch from the margins to see how the world a year on is reeling from the effects of this pandemic, affecting us economically, socially, even environmentally. So without further ado, we have a video from His Excellency, Minister Enrico Giovanni, Giovannini, uh, who is the Italian minister of for sustainable infrastructure and mobility. If the video can be streamed, please. Thank you. The European Union and uh, several other countries are designing uh, strategies uh, to get out of the crisis that uh, we are facing uh, due to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. It's not easy because the uncertainties uh, about uh, the medical uh, situation are still very high. Notwithstanding that uh, the European Union and Italy in particular is planning uh, its uh, pathway towards recovery and resilience, according to the wording uh, chosen by the European Union 
in these great, large, I would say, historical uh, plan for uh, uh, recovery of our economies and our society. I took uh, the role of Minister of uh, Infrastructures and Transports just one month ago. And one of the very first things that I decided to do was to change the name of the ministry from uh, Ministry for Infrastructures and Transport to Ministry for Sustainable Infrastructures and Mobility. Was not just a, a nominal change, was a clear way to flag that we need to change quite radically the way in which we design infrastructures, the way in which we manage mobility systems, everything in light of sustainability. Sustainability, which is not only environmental sustainability, but also economic sustainability, social sustainability. And of course, innovation, including digital innovation, is key to make this change. Italy will get uh, uh, from the uh, next generation EU initiative around uh, 200 billion euros. And one fourth of this amount uh, will be managed by uh, our ministry according to two main missions. The first, the, environmental and uh, uh, ecological transition. And the second one is uh, sustainable uh, mobility. In our plans, uh, we are planning to have uh, huge investments into railways uh, systems, into greening the system of uh, transports, but also developing uh, new plans uh, for improving our uh, buildings, both private and public buildings in light of the ecological transition. In addition, we will also invest uh, a lot of money into greening uh, the ports and also maritime transports. So in other words, is a, a change of uh, culture, but is a shift in the way in which investment plans are designed and implemented, especially because uh, we need to implement all the programs, uh, all the projects that are included into the, uh, this recovery and resilience plan by 2026, which means that uh, we need to speed up the process for investments, especially in Italy, where building new infrastructures take too long. But on the other hand, we need to cooperate with the local authorities, regions, municipalities, the private sector and stakeholders in order to make this plan really a change in the way in which the Italian economy and the Italian society work. On top, we have some other long-term investment plans that are financed by national sources, the national budget. And the two must be fully connected. This is why in the organization of the ministry, I established uh, uh, a new organization with uh, different uh, teams that work together in order to design, implement, uh, and also evaluate the impact of the, the different projects in light of the 2030 Agenda. 2030 Agenda is a great uh, framework in order to understand uh, whether what you do is going in the right direction, but also in order to exploit synergies across different projects. This is why one of our teams is just looking at the way in which uh, the projects uh, will have a positive, in some cases, uh, in some cases, negative uh, impacts on the different dimensions of sustainability. And we will look also at this uh, impact evaluation 
using uh, uh, econometric models, economic models, in order to evaluate trade-offs and synergies. So it's a new way of approaching. And uh, I brought this uh, new approach into a ministry that lost uh, over the last two de decades its capacity of uh, planning in terms of uh, medium long-term priorities and implement these actions uh, uh, very quickly. The good news is that the entire government uh, led by Mario Draghi is uh, adopting uh, this approach to sustainability. And in fact, the change of uh, the Ministry of, for Environment into Ministry for Ecological Transition, absorbing also the competencies of another ministry in charge of energy policies is another signal of the fact that most of the recovery and resilience plan will be spent by these two ministries uh, coherently and looking at uh, sustainability as uh, the main driver. So in conclusion, uh, the way ahead uh, is still very complex, of course, but uh, the pathway is very uh, well defined in terms of 2030 agenda and in terms of sustain sustainability from all dimensions uh, according to the, the agenda. The European Union, on the other hand, has a special responsibility vis-a-vis -vis other parts of the world. And this is where uh, events like this one, led by the uh, UN SDG uh, action uh, campaign are so important in order to share the best practices, but also mobilize companies, people, societies, governments to speed up the process of implementation of the 2030 agenda, notwithstanding the crisis that we are facing now. Thank you very much. There we have it, a really inspiring speech from Minister Giovannini, really looking at the three pillars, the three Ps, people, planet, and prosperity. So without further ado, we're now going to have our live interventions and we have a good panel of speakers. And we're going to start with Gemma Arpia, who is the working group uh, coordinator for the um, SDG 17 on SDG 17 and works for the International, the Italian Alliance Action for Sustainable Development. Over to you, Gemma. Thanks, thanks, Chair, and a good day. Uh, well, civil society is involved in the work of the G20 through the so-called engagement group Civil 20, C20 which is uh, composed not only by civil uh, society organizations from the G20 countries, but include also representatives from low and middle income countries, because we believe that issues like uh, social, uh, environment, uh, um, economics, uh, it refer, it's a problem of everybody and everywhere. So we don't have an engagement group of only uh, G20 civil society, but is a global platform. We had a meeting early this year uh, for uh, this new round of G20, and uh, we've been almost 200 participants also from uh, Africa, China, Americas, um, Asia Pacific, and uh, has been agreed a lot of uh, priorities or position at least, but. Uh, Today, I want just to underline two of these main priorities we addressed. The first one is the global financial architecture. And the second one, the universal health coverage. From a financial point of view, we have seen the need for low-income countries to, to increase the fiscal space. The fiscal space is the capacity of the state for spending to protect people, to relaunch the economy, to implement the agenda. So uh, the need to enlarge this fiscal space is jeopardized by the debt burden. 
There has been a, a debt service suspension last year in the G20, which has been prolonged till the, the end of this year, but is just not enough. It was a little help. Today, we need to work out a mechanism convening also the private, uh, uh, the private creditor, because most of the, 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 the credit are held by private and multilateral creditors. So we need to work out within the UN system a way to address the problem of the debt and to, to also arrive to the idea of debt cancellation, not only debt replanification, replanning or debt conversion. There are low income countries who cannot afford to make the debt conversion. We just need debt cancellation, but it should be made. Uh, I mean, uh, the G20 can be championed idea, but the decision should be made within the UN system. Regarding the, the health point of view, we just want to remind that the problem of the COVID Act Accelerator, which is, was a multilateral initiative, which now is uh, facing a, a acute shortage of funding. The four pillars, test, treatment, vaccine, and reinforcement of health system are underfunded. They are funded just for one third of their need. And the most alarming aspect is what is happening in COVAX. We know it's the multilateral initiative to coordinate the vaccine distribution in 92 countries. Up to now, only 52 countries has been uh, uh, coordinated and received uh, a part of uh, vaccine from, uh, from COVAX. And in those days, we are seeing what is happening in Europe regarding you know, the problem of export of vaccine and so on. Uh, the, the other aspect impacting on the, the situation is uh, also the rejection in the WTO of the request of the TRIPS waiver. I mean, TRIPS is uh, the Treaty for uh, Right Intellectual Property on Vaccine. Uh, several countries have asked for uh, the waiver of TRIPS, but the most advanced economy just to now, they refused to accept. So, for today, what I want to say, now is the time to start action in this pandemic towards sustainability. So I, of course, uh, the last aspect I don't want to forget is the role of ODA, the, I mean, the International Development Cooperation. Today, many of our countries, you know, facing the pandemics are thinking to cut the aid. But in this time where globally remittances are decreasing, trade is decreasing, uh, foreign direct investment are decreasing because of the pandemic, the role of uh, ODA is fundamental. So we want a full commitment from the G20 countries on the use. They keep their international agreed commitment on ODA of 0.7% to ODA. Thanks, Chair. Thank you so much, Gemma. You raised some really important points. I mean, this 52 out of 92 countries, it's quite actually daunting. Um, and also the debt cancellation issues, which are really coming up to the fore, and I think are part of the G20 discussions now. We have quite a number of questions for you, but um, I'd like to hand over now to the, to the next panelist so that um, I'll come back to you a little bit later. The next speaker is Professor Agnes Bazin, who is the Director General's Envoy on Multilateral Affairs at World Health Organization. Uh, welcome, Agnes. Um, if you can give us an intervention, you heard from Gemma there calling for action and would like to hear from the role of the WHO in this crisis. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak today in such a wonderful panel. And I would like to give you the perspective from WHO towards a sustainable recovery, because it is the question you ask. So for us, there is, I would say, two major issues. First, achieving SDG 3, the Health uh, Sustainable Development Goal, which due to the pandemic, 
we are now farther, farther than the, uh, from the goal. Mm. Prior to the pandemic, remarkable gains made over several decades impacted several major health indicators. For example, maternal mortality, um, as well as those for children under five, were significantly reduced. And despite these advancements, prior to the pandemic, the world was not on track to achieve some of the health-related SDG targets by 2030. Many countries, especially low-income countries, faced significant challenges as they strive to achieve these targets. The COVID-19 pandemic is making the prospects of achieving several key SDGs remote and has highlighted increasing inequalities between and within countries. How do we get back on the track? We need to invest more in health, especially in health systems and universal health coverage, ensuring that we leave no one behind, especially those that are most fragile. And we need to strengthen, for example, primary health care. Before the pandemic, many people thought that health was a cost. Now it is clear, health is not a cost, it is an investment. The second issue is that this pandemic has shown us the importance of health and how it is linked to various other sectors, such as economy, society, environment. The COVID-19 pandemic is a stark reminder of the close links between the health of humans, animals, and the planet we share. Over the last several centuries, human development, urbanization, migration, large-scale agriculture, li and livestock practices, combined with biodiversity loss and climate change, have impacted how we live. Humans, animals, and microbes share the same ecosystem. And more than 70% of emerging disease discovered in recent years are linked to animal to human transmission. Today, we must rethink our approach to addressing these issues. Changes in the ecosystem that affect human health, life, like environment degradation, climate change, agricultural practices, should be addressed through comprehensive policies and enforcement. Major health challenges including antimicrobial resistance, food safety, and pandemic preparedness cannot be effectively addressed by one sector or one nation alone. One such way to address this issue is One Health. One Health is an approach to designing and implementing programs, policies, legislation, and research in which multiple sectors communicate and work together to achieve better public health outcomes. A One Health approach linking human, animal, and environment health is needed to address all these issues and build back better. The pandemic has demonstrated that we need to take our work to the next level. That's why together, we have agreed to establish a One Health high-level expert panel supported by a joint secretariat, which will draw on the expertise of WHO, OIE, FAO, and UN Environment to improve the scientific basis for political decision-making, promote political commitment, and increase public awareness. We have one planet, one health. If we have learned anything this past year, it is that none of us can go it alone. We can only thrive when we work together across institutions and across borders. We must share information, data, research, and best practices to better understand the links between human, animal, and environment health and prevent human diseases. 
We live in an ever-changing world. This will not be the, less, the least outbreak of a zoonotic disease, but with stronger policy, a stronger approach and stronger partnerships, we can prevent, prepare, and mitigate the impact of future outbreaks of zoonotic disease and make our world healthier, safer, fairer, and more sustainable for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Agnes. Health is not a cost, but an investment. I wonder, just a quick question to you, do you think governments are listening that health sectors need to be invested in better? I think it hasn't been uh, so true. I mean, I think now that there is a political commitment to understand that health is, will never be any more a cost. Indeed, it's a wake up call. Great to hear about the one health high level uh, plan, plan that you have with all the different organizations. Collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. The next speaker I turn to is Mr. Vazu Gaunden, who is from South Africa and the founder and executive director of Accord. Over to you, Vasu, please. We have Vasu. Yeah, I'm. Uh, you know, it's sensational. <laughs> now I remember that I put it on. So, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Musanda, let me thank Marina Ponti and uh, the Italian government and APSIS. So always a pleasure, Marina, to be part of the SDG Action uh, Festival. Musanda, let me start where Agnes left off. And Agnes, I think you know the evidence on zoonotic diseases and uh, was was there. You know. Uh, for, for, for many, many years. And I see, Gail, you're shaking your head. I know this was a big debate in the US because US government had all of the intelligence and information also, but many other governments had the same thing. Yet we, as a global community, we were totally unprepared uh, for this crisis. And I think, you know, when you say, what are the lessons that have been learned from the current crisis? That's the biggest lesson, that actually we did not prepare in advance and in the field that I work in conflict management, we call it early warning and early warning has to go with early action. There was no early action. So I think there's a big lesson for the entire world. However, despite all of that, I think the great thing is that we adapted very, very fast as a global community in dealing with the crisis. Uh, it, it come at a huge cost when we look at the numbers of people and we look now at the third wave uh, in Europe, et cetera. Now, uh, you know, in Africa, uh, despite all the resultant divisions that came from, you know, colonialism, the linguistic differences that we have and the power and politics and all of that, I think one of the positive things that the uh, pandemic has done for Africa is that it's created a pan-African solidarity. And we've seen that in the response uh, to the uh, pandemic from the Africa CDC, from the African Union. Uh, my own president, Cyril Ramaphosa, was the chair of the African Union and led a number of these initiatives. So I think, you know, we will have to capitalize on that as Africa because we're going to enter now into this decade a very, very deep crisis. So the, the health crisis we know now has resulted in an economic crisis. And the economic crisis will result in a security crisis, and that security crisis will have humanitarian consequences. So I think these are, you know, the lessons that we have learned. And uh, Gemma, you correctly point out, you know, debt cancellation, ODA, these are the key issues that have to be put on the agenda, on the G20 agenda, uh, because without debt cancellation, without the G20 sustaining the same levels of commitment, uh, without treating health as an investment rather than as a cost, uh, we are not going to be able to resolve the problems, particularly where we are here on the continent. What opportunities are emerging? Coming to your question, second question, Musanda, and what is possible today, which was not possible months ago? I think the glaring thing is that, well, the vaccine, you know, it takes 10 years to develop a vaccine, but the world has developed the vaccine in, you know, uh, now. In one year, we've developed this vaccine and it's come because there has been collaboration. But the, on the flip side, 
the vaccine nationalism and the competition, geopolitical competition for producing the first effective vaccine. These have been the negative consequences in the world. And with the global uh, problems that we have and the global solutions that are needed, we cannot have this kind of geopolitical competition. And what we are seeing currently, you know, the kind of saber rattling that's going on uh, globally amongst the major powers in the world, this is not helpful when we're dealing with a global uh, pandemic. So what is happening now that needs to be aligned with the 2030 agenda, people, planet, and prosperity? The first, I think, is that the pandemic has uh, done something. And, you know, uh, Marina, you know, we've been doing so much yourself. You've done great work in educating the world about the SDGs, etc. And what the pandemic has done is actually done a lot of the education that we would have done. It's brought to the fore all these problems about inequality, gender, uh, discrimination, all of that. And we need to capitalize that. And to end, of course, Musanda, since your hand is up, I can see. Yes, we launched the uh, Global Peace Platform together with SDG Action Campaign, UN 75, and others. And what we were looking at, we did 100 intergenerational dialogues in 100 cities across the world, focusing on building sustainable societies, equitable societies, protecting the environment, and sharing knowledge for human uh, progress. So what we have to do with the SDGs now, with the 2030 agenda, is move and capitalize on that conscientization that has taken place to move to action to uh, realize the goals of uh, 2030. Thank you, Musanda. No, thank you so very much, Vas. You really raised some critical points. I think that your, your opening was so poignant and really uh, something, the preparedness, how ready are we? And I'm really glad because the next speaker, uh, Mr. Augustino Ingusho, uh, who's a senior expert in the government of Italy and also part of the G20 Sherpa, office is, is, is a climate expert. And I'm, I'm very curious and because it's kind of a serendipitous year. Not only is Italy the G20 president, it's also the COP, uh, COP26 co-president. And so it's really interesting. It will be interesting to hear from you. Do you think we are ready? Here we are in a pandemic and so we were not ready. And now this climate change that has obviously not stopped. How do we go ahead? Over to you, please, Augustine. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you, Muzunda. And thank you to Marina Ponti, Pierluigi Stefanini, your respective organizations for this timely event and for this important showing of leaderships and to my fellow panelists here today. But at the same time, indeed, from what I understand from Marina, there must be more than 20,000 people listening. So I'm very thrilled and a bit nervous to be with all of you. And, uh, and really, I thank you for your support and for participating and showing interest. As Muzunda said, uh, really 2021, is aligning um, to be a crucial year, not only because, of course, uh, the world, the global community together has to emerge uh, from uh, this certain tragic pandemic that has affected us all, but because, of course, the parallel crises are not, any, are not going anywhere, right? So, for instance, the climate change crisis must be firmly under our radar if we are not only to uh, solve the existing uh, health crisis, but also to emerge stronger and with a more resilient uh, society. So this is precisely what uh, we try to do with our G20 and our co-partnership with um, the UK for uh, COP26. So we heard from many of the panelists today that really cooperation and collaborations are the only way to face the challenges that we're facing co um, collectively. So as, as you said so well, of course, vaccines are one example of that, but naturally climate change also comes to the mind as one of such uh, issues where global collaborations is necessary. So therefore, as one of the crucial aspects to build and develop such uh, global collaborations, I'm thrilled that the Italian G20 presidency has, become, has begun such full speed. And I'm very happy to have the opportunity today to discuss this with you. So let me start by stressing how relevant it is for us, the role of the United Nations leadership and its Sustainable Development Goals agenda also in the fight against climate change, certainly, but also towards environment, the fight against environmental degradations, and also really this leadership towards a sustainable, green, and inclusive uh, future for, our, for us. On this, I'd like to quote uh, the Secretary General in his State of the Planet speech, where he concluded that solidarity is humanity, solidarity is survival, and this is the great lesson of 2020. And really, I couldn't agree more. 
And this is why for our work in the G20, we developed this concept that indeed is very like linked to the agenda 2030 of these three pillars, right? People, planet and prosperities that are underpinning the safety of our common house. So these uh, pillars represent the backbone of all our efforts and the holistic strategy we, we believe is essential from the G20 level to address the, the challenges that are affecting uh, humanity as a whole. So as Muzunda said, we are also partners with COP with UK in achieving also successful COP26. And really we can see how Italy in this, in this manner is quite at the center of building a momentum for multilateral cooperation. Right? And this momentum for multilateral cooperation is what is going to get us out uh, of the crisis uh, that is still unfortunately ongoing, but also will help us in uh, building back better towards a brighter and more uh, sustainable future. From our side as G20 presidencies, we see these tasks as not particularly easy, right? Because we go from uh, responding to the pandemic to building multilateral corporations and ensuring a sustainable recovery. At the same time, you know, we are helping these tasks by the fact that we have clear objectives in our minds and our commitments to the Paris Agreement and to the Sustainable Development Goals can no longer be postponed. And this is why our both essential concepts during our presidency. And I know there are many young people listening in today and considering that this is the crucial year where we're going to build together the next decade. And uh, the next decade is probably all we've got left to fight against the climate crisis. It's so important that you are here today with us to help us shape this future together. The scientists that warn us about, for instance, the fact that the past decade was the hottest ever recorded globally are the same scientists that tell us that we're still in time to act if we act, uh, if we act rapid, rapidly. So, of course, all together, we need to see the well-being of our planet as a common house. And in this way is the only way in which we will be able to address uh, these challenges. And as Agnes uh, said so very clearly just now, uh, it's obvious now that the health of our planet and the health and our health, our global health, are clearly intertwined. And this, I believe, is something where the G20 can play a very important role, because you know not only is it an essential multilateral instrument, but really what I like about it is the diversity of its membership, the diversity that can allow us all to tackle global challenges. And uh, I thank you, Chair, and over to you. Well, thank you so very much. The power of multilateralism and why it matters and how it needs to be inclusive, stay inclusive and bring on board all different stakeholders, young people and all the like, so that we have a planet that is obviously giving us the health that we require. This next speaker, lastly but not the least, is um, from the one campaign, brilliant campaign. Ms. Gail E. Smith is the president and CEO of the one campaign. Gail, would like to hear from you in terms of what you've heard from the different speakers. I think you have the, 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 the privilege of having heard from all of this, rounding all of that up. Your thoughts, please. Sure, <clears throat> and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you to everyone, including our hosts and my fellow speakers. I could just say, like they said, thank you very much, I'm done. But let me, let me just hit a few points, if I may. You know, we're, we're talking about the importance of multilateralism. I think what we have to understand is that failure to collaborate is dangerous. I worked on the Ebola epidemic in West Africa when I was in the Obama White House and uh, <clears throat> had one of the leading roles on that. And in my mind throughout was this notion that if the virus is moving faster than we are, it's winning. Still today, a year in, COVID-19 is moving faster than we are. And part of that is the failure of the international community to come together to use the multilateral institutions that we have as effectively as possible in order to deny that virus the place to spread and mutate. So I think, yes, it's important. I think we also have to underscore the dangers of failing to collaborate and use that to make the point that it's in all of our individual as well as our collective interests to join forces. I think another lesson from this, and it's, it's not a lesson to many, it's obvious to many, but it's been made obvious to many decision makers in ways I think are important, is the systemic inequities that have been laid bare. And this is true within communities. 
within countries, between countries, and across the planet. And we've seen it because we know in crises, those with the fewest coping mechanisms at hand are the worst affected. And we're seeing that at scale <clears throat> all over the planet. Most obviously with vaccines that people have made reference to, we are in a situation now where rather than having a global plan, this is epidemiology, this is science, this is systems engineering, to make sure that we are smarter than and beat the virus, We've got a very uneven system. And any of us who live in a country where we're fortunate enough to be getting vaccines now or soon are thrilled that our governments are doing so. But what we also need to collectively understand is that again, it's in our collective interest that those vaccines be made available everywhere. Because that's what's gonna determine whether we shorten the lifespan of the pandemic or we extend it. And whether in so doing, we expand the economic fallout we've seen, or we can get to the moment where we can start to address it. And this gets to my, my third point, and I'm gonna to get to a point of optimism and what must be done. But I think that the moment we're in right now is we've got one pandemic, and the question is, are we gonna have two futures or one future? And for, these, for, for the reasons of that fundamental question, think about it. Where's the world going to go over the next coming years? We're going to have an economic crisis to deal with for some time. But wealthy countries, countries that are able to do so, are going to be making an increasing pivot towards green economies, much more focus on climate and on digital. What about other countries that have been so hard hit by this pandemic that they are unable to make the pivot? That gives us two worlds. What if part of the world is vaccinated in 2021 and 22, other parts in 23, 24? That doesn't work. So where does that bring us? The G20, I think, has never been more important. Uh, and to our friends and colleagues from Italy, we're thrilled that you're leading it. We are hopeful. We will support you, but we're ambitious. And I think part of the question before the G20 is whether the G20's remit is about the global economy or the largest economies. And we know that its membership is the largest economies. That's okay, but it's got the remit, the potential to focus on the whole of the global economy. Its action on debt service is an indication of a recognition that it is not just countries like my own that have had to pass trillion dollar surplus bills to recover. It's other countries that can't generate those trillions that are also affected. But I agree with the other speakers. We need to see much more on the debt side. We've got good movement in what appears to be agreement on special drawing rights from the IMF. That has to happen quickly. But this debt issue is going to be a long time crisis. And we need to extend the lifespan of this debt service initiative, SDRs and other things, rather than moving along incrementally. But I think the G20 is critically important at this time, particularly at a time when Multilateralism has not been at its most thriving. This is, this is a forum that can really drive home the political importance, but the tangible impacts for real people. If countries cooperate, we're all, we are all safer, have a greater chance of opportunity, and are more secure. And let me bring it back to the SDGs. On the one hand, we've seen the first increase in extreme poverty that we've seen in 25 years. There's some real setbacks, HIV AIDS across the board. On the other hand, what better moment to be making the point about the need to ensure that we do not have such a huge number of people or countries that are so vulnerable to threats like this, which we will see more of, and to underscore the universality of the SDGs. Because even the wealthiest countries have seen huge economic impacts, huge impacts in their health sectors. So there's a moment there. Where I will close is just to go back to something that was said in the introduction, we're in a period where people have lost faith in government. And I understand that. I do not think that governments, individually, some have done very well. Collectively, I think governments could have done a lot better job during the last year to organize themselves uh, and really fight this virus. But even where you may not have faith in a government, you may think a government's incompetent, governments actually pay attention when people have strong views and they start to be aired. So one of the things that we have learned, I'm fortunate to run an organization, we don't ask our supporters for money, we ask for their voice. 
we all need to use our voices, make the criticisms where they're due, but also put out the proposals and recommendations for where we need to get, because it actually matters. I've been on the exercising my voice activist side, but I've also been on the government side more than a few times and it works. So where I'd like to end is I just hope everybody listening and participating, even if you're losing a bit of faith in governments, understand even the worst government starts to pay attention when they think they may be losing the populace. So let me end there and thanks. Well, thank you so very much, Gail. That this really brings me straight, straight to the Q&A and it's been absolutely wonderful listening in to everyone. And I have a question for you in particular. You know, where do you see, you talked about your activism and how you, you were present both in ag, you know, government and, and also outside of it. Where do you, how do you see the role of, of young people, particularly how they sort of you know, drive the agenda or agenda 2030 and the complexity of it and policy? But also, um, if you can give us an example, perhaps, from one of the campaigns that you've been involved in or advocacy. Percy. Sure. Um, um, I think the role is absolutely central uh, because it's our, our younger members of our communities that are thinking the furthest out. So if you want the far reaching, the big ideas, the, the bold ideas that if you're older, you might say, oh, I don't know, on things like climate or what the world should look like in the future. It's from, it's from young voices that we're gonna get that inspiration and aspiration. Number two, young people are gonna vote for a long time. And let's be very practical. Politicians tend to recognize that. I think the third thing is that I think youth activists are playing a much greater role than ever before in shaping the environment and shaping debates because of the mastery of social media, other techniques of engaging, mobilizing, and organizing. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, we do this all over the world, but in the United States where we have activists across the countries, we do everywhere. We bring them together once a year. <clears throat> uh, we had over 200 of them recently from every state and union, different constituencies, different political parties, because that's really, really important to what we do. And they did a training and in a day or two did over 200 meetings with our Congress at a time when our Congress was considering this big American rescue plan, which had in it $11.5 billion for the US international response to the pandemic. It makes a huge difference. I have watched senators who are less impressed by a celebrity than they are with three 25 year olds from their district. And I've seen it in the US, I've seen it in Europe, I've seen it in Africa. It's that informed, ambitious, determined, uh, I'm a citizen, you need to listen to me, that walks into the room and makes the case that makes a difference. And even better if he or she on the way out, if we get what we want, says thank you. That's fantastic. They're going to be the, the voters for a long time. That is such a great point. Yeah. Um, Augustino, I want to come to you as, as part of the G20. How do we, I mean, just listening into what Gail has said, how do we make this process inclusive? And, and, and where do you, you know, how can we make sure that young people um, and, and also the leaders involved in the G20 uh, are, are making this inclusive uh, and, and also as part of this recovery and as we look towards a better world? Thank you, Mizunda. Thank you, Gael. Uh, just uh, very quickly adding on uh, what Gael has just said. Uh, indeed, this need to involve uh, the youth at the center of our ambitions for you know, the future is also the reason why we are particularly proud as Italy and as co-host of COP26 to host the Youth for Climate events that we built towards, uh, towards uh, the Glasgow meeting. So this is very important. No, our efforts in terms of building inclusivity and involving um, the youth in the G20 uh, approach at the moment is mostly related to the fact that we have this engagement group that has been mentioned before as well, like uh, Civil 20. So there is one specific Youth 20 where I encourage everyone to get involved. So they are, uh, op they are open the, the call for volunteering and essentially the Youth 20 will uh, have a parallel stream essentially where they will work together with uh, working groups in the official so to speak g20 track for instance we're working together on some uh, of the policy outcomes expected for the environmental working group so this is one example where youth are involved uh, first hand and in general of course in terms of recovery as uh, Mr. Giovannini 
said at the beginning, right? So our all uh, European and Italian approach to the recovery is very much along these two streams of ecological and digital transitions, but really the name of the plan is called Next Generation EU for a reason, right? So essentially here, the question is, how do we ensure that there is not a lost uh, generation caused by the pandemic? And beyond this, of course, we are also painfully aware of the differences in capacities around the world in re-emerging from this crisis. So our main trust in that sense is essentially to create a playing field for the green transition that then doesn't create a green divide, right? So where you know, the affordability of technologies, for instance, is a key aspect of our work in the Climate Sustainability Working Group. Uh, energy access and energy security with a focus on Africa is a key aspect of our energy transition working group. Our development working group is looking into the question about the relief to create more fiscal space for a green recovery. So, you know, we are working on this along all tracks, both in the Sherpa track and in the finance track of our efforts. And um, to go back also very rapidly on the question of how we see this forum, right? Whether it's a rich, uh, rich kids club or whether it's a representative club. Well, you know, fair enough, it started as a rich kids club. You know, we know that essentially before the crisis of 2009, it was essentially only a finance ministry, uh, a financial ministry forum. But, you know, it's morphed crisis after crisis. And we believe that this is the year where we will morph into something different again. And we are particularly proud of the fact that, for instance, the Democratic Republic of Congo is invited and an active participant in all of our events. So it's Rwanda, so are the many other countries. So, you know, there is an effort to break the divide. Thank you so very much. An inclusive process towards our recovery. Vasu, I want to come to you. Africa, Africa really, you know, how are the world leaders listening and incorporating African voices in this global response of this pandemic in your mind? Yeah, thanks, Masanda. Well, if they are listening, we need a patent waiver and we need it now. Uh, you know, I'm here in South Africa. I've just gone to South Sudan and Sudan. I didn't have the vaccine because uh, you know, we we had a variant and the AstraZeneca vaccine that we had, 1.5 million of them couldn't work. We had to give them to the African Union. We're now at the back of the queue and we are getting them in drips and drabs. And a, 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 a app that came out yesterday globally shows that at the current rate, it will take us 40 years to vaccinate 75% of our people. You know, so this is unacceptable in a world where there are, there is all solutions to the vaccines. We have the facilities in South Africa. We have a company in South Africa that's already producing the vaccines, but we cannot get those vaccines. They're producing them. It's Aspen Pharmaceuticals and they have to go outside of South Africa simply because of the patents. So if you ask me if the G20 is listening and if governments are listening, we need a patent wa waiver and we need it yesterday. Thank you for your intervention, patent waiver. There you have it. Agnes, I come to you, WHO. The leaders have been really looking and discussing very concretely. And how do we get youth voices, especially when you spoke about health systems and how to implement some of the proposals on the table? How do you include, for instance, youth voices within the One Health Agenda? I would like to say three points. The first one is that we all have an important role to play to protect ourselves, our communities, those who need our support and to build back better. First point. Second point, more than half of the world population is under 30 years old. How can we build back, build back better without the young people? So WHO has launched a youth council it is a platform for young people to engage directly with WHO on all these issues. And we want to hear your voices. We need to understand better your needs and concerns. And we need to benefit from your ideas and suggestions. And the third point is to call to all institutions to listen to the young. And institution, governments, we have to listen, we have to engage with, we, we get, we, I'm sorry, we need to empower young adults 
as partners in action in every subject that we are dealing with. Those are the three points I want to say. Thank you very much. I'm so glad to hear WHO has this youth council. Gemma, coming to you, civil society roles. You talked about you talked about the role of different civil society groups across the world. So how inclusive are, are these, um, this, this process in your mind going forward? Oh, well, I would say that uh, I will bring just the Italian example of ASVIS, taking, you know, as uh, an example to be uh, exported, <laughs> if you want. I mean, uh, in ASVIS, which is an alliance of uh, almost 300 members, members came from a very, very different background. We have social partners like the business part, the trade unions, the third sector uh, uh, representative. Then we have a public and private university. We have association of local authorities, local institutions. So uh, we, we think that uh, the, this is a forum for sharing uh, uh, different background. That means also different expertises. Basically, we have three roles, monitoring, criticizing, and proposing. Uh, every year, for instance, we publish a report checking, monitoring the indicators for Italy uh, on the SDGs and comparing with other uh, uh, European countries. And uh, uh, of course, uh, making a, a part of the report is on proposal or what we propose coming from different think tank and uh, as I said, experience, we propose to the government and to the institution, our position and the possibly practical uh, uh, tools to, to, to get things changing. And uh, every year we publish a commentary note to the uh, financial law uh, as the government uh, if, the, if the financial law is approved by the parliament, we prepare a commentary explaining the, what is in line with the uh, agenda 2030 and what is bringing us out of the pathway. Then uh, the, the, the most visible activity is the festival on sustainable development, mm -hmm. which every year is made of almost 1000 events. Mm -hmm. organized from uh, all members of ASBIS in uh, every town, in every region in Italy. And it's a festival during 17 days, one day for uh, each goal. And it gives us uh, a lot of visibility toward the institution, but also the possibility to reach out to you know, uh, local organization, uh, community organization in the different region. So it's an enrichment also for us who organize just you know, to get input and to enlarge our, our constituency. I'm absolutely in all of your model. You not only monitor or criticize, you propose solutions. This is fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm really deeply honored and it's just been so wonderful listening to you and young people out there listening. You There you heard it from the G20, the Youth 20, the um, upcoming events with the um, Youth for Climate Action. That's going to be the pre-COP events and just amazing campaigns. We heard from one campaign, a lot of exciting exciting initiatives be part of the change that you want to see. It's really amazing. Marina, I thank you so very much. And other colleagues in the back end, making sure that the technical um, elements worked. And uh, this is where I say goodbye and wishing you all the best. And let's be positive and be safe. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.